Welcome to the Suckness Student Presentations and COVID webinar. Um, my name is Katerina, and in this webinar, we will be discussing student research presentations for the 2020 Suckness National Conference. Thank you for joining us today. First, few things I want to mention. If you have any questions throughout the panel portion of this webinar, please submit them via the Q&A feature and we will address as many as we can at the end. We are recording this webinar, so you will also have the chance to rewatch it and share it with your peers later. If you have any additional questions that we don't get to, please stay to the end of this webinar and you will see how to continue the conversation in SACNAS online community. So now let's get started. As of today, the SACNAS conference is still planned to occur scheduled. However, we are monitoring the situation closely and we will look into contingency plans if needed. Meanwhile, SACNAS is actively looking for ways to support our students. In response to this, we extended the research presentations deadline until July 10th. Uh, we also will be uh, accepting applications from all student members level. Travel scholarships portion is not part of this webinar topic, but many of you have asked. So I just wanted to let you know that we also extended travel scholarships deadline until July 10th. If you have more questions, visit Travel Scholarship webpage or email me directly at travelscholarships at sasnet.org. So now let me introduce our speakers. We have six SACNA student presentation subcommittee members. They are our experts who advise us on student presentation matters. We have Mario Bonuelos, Megan Hamilton, Gabriel Quinones, Evan Reynolds, Jose Vargas, who is also the chair of the subcommittee, and Rosa Leon Zayas. So let's start the discussion with the concern over uncertainty about summer research programs. What are some steps that students can take to verify the status of their program? Rosa? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, first of all, I really want to start by uh, telling, hoping that everybody is doing well and staying healthy. Um, I think. From, from myself, and I, I feel like most of my uh, committee members share this sentiment that really we, we think one of our first priorities, regardless of uh, the status of your summer program or the research that you're doing or your summer plans, is that uh, one of your first priorities should be to you know, take care of yourself and take care of your family of choice or your family of origin and make sure that you are taking care of your health physically and mentally. So, Number one thing, really take time to take care of yourself. As you think into the future, we know that many of you have plans or had plans to go on to summer research programs that you had been accepted or were waiting to hear from. And I, we know it's very disappointing as many programs have decided to cancel their programs. And we'll talk more about uh, that into the, in the future in the next uh, couple of minutes. Uh, and then many of you are probably wondering what's happening. You haven't heard from them. Uh, as they are, like us, trying to deal with all of this uncertainty and trying to figure out what is the best way to move forward with some of the programs. So I would say that one of the first things to do if you have not heard from your uh, summer program coordinators yet is to reach out, right? Send those people an email uh, or trying to contact them by phone uh, uh, to inquire what are their plans uh, for their summer program and when would you be able to hear? I know personally from uh, my experience and my many colleagues that host students through the summer program that there's a big variety of things that people are doing, right? In my institution, we have moved into hosting summer program students that can uh, perform some summer research uh, online virtually, that being using bioinformatics or statistics, or which we'll talk more about in, in a little bit. Uh, so the students that we'll have for the future, which will be paid positions, we will host virtually, basically. Uh, other institutions are doing the same. And there's some institutions that their work through the summer often is very hands-on, in the lab, along many people. And then in that situation, many uh, programs have decided to cancel the summer program. So 
um, that's definitely uh, something that you should reach out and figure out what the plan are. Um, I, I also wanted to say that if you're somewhere outside of your home, outside of the institution, uh, if, if your summer program was outside of the, your, your home institution, uh, and that program has, not, has been canceled or will not longer happen in that way, this might be a good time to reach out to people in your home institution, in your department, or people that you're interested in working with, and asking if there's a possibility for you to do some work with people in your home institutions that you're interested in that can be done remotely. Thank you, Rosa. What should students do if they are still unsure about their summer research program status? Hi, I'm Megan. Um, so if students have been doing research during the semester and you're still unsure about the status of your summer research plans, what you should do is, uh, there's a couple things you could do. You can consider submitting an abstract based on the research that you conducted in previous semesters, is probably this spring. And then you can also uh, consider reaching out to your mentors to ask for feedback regarding whether that's a plausible option for you. Um, you can also reach out for um, an idea as to like feedback regarding abstracts that you're wanting to submit and get um, feedback from your mentor or your advisor as well. And then um, I would also, if I were in your shoes, I would follow um, abstract preparation guidelines on the SOCNOS website as well as uh, focus on answering questions that you may have within this um, webinar, as well as maybe you could answer, ask them at the end of the webinar when we pose questions to the audience. Thank you, Megan. And I will also add to that, we recently published a webinar on how to write a successful abstract. So make sure to check that as well. Um, in case you know that your summer research program is canceled, um, what tips, subcommittee, what tips can you provide to our students who, whose summer research program is canceled? I'll go ahead and start. Um, one of the things that you can do is reach out to your research mentor at your institution and just inquire about the possibility that you can continue the project remotely. So this could be either a theoretical approach or a computational approach. Um, so in, on the computational side, you can try to look at simulation studies, um, genomics research. These are, these are things that we, you can try to tackle remotely. And I think having that conversation with your advisor or your research mentor is important during this time. Yeah, I think, you know, one other thing, you know, that, that kind of in addition to that is, uh, you know, everybody's online now, we're all kind of stuck at home. So what better time than to uh, add to your, your repertoire and your skill set and continue learning. And so uh, there are a variety of online uh, learning courses, uh, programs. So uh, Coursera uh, is, is kind of, you know, at, at the top of the list. This is, uh, you know, done by professors at accredited institutions going through basically an online course on a huge variety of topics, uh, you know, not just computer language and bioinformatics, but business and, and, and lots of other things as well. Uh, LinkedIn Learning is also a very good one. You know, LinkedIn is a you know, kind of a professional, you know, so, you know social networking uh, you know, type of thing, but there's also a learning component to that. And they've got a lot of those type of classes as well. Um, you might've seen in the news recently about Harvard offering you know, up there online courses and, and those types of things for, for people to take and that uh, Stanford has been doing that for a while as well. So you can you can look on a variety of university websites and find online courses to that. Um, some of these are free. A lot of them are not and they and they, they vary in their pricing. Um, and sometimes you get what you pay for. Sometimes you get more. Sometimes you get less. Uh, there are um, quite a few uh, free learning opportunities as well and ones that are um, kind of budget minded. So depending on your budget, if um, you know, they can, they can be as, as little as like $13 for a course on, on Udemy um, or um, you can take whole courses that are kind of priced monthly where you know, like Code Academy, if you want to learn on that, has like $19 a month plans. So it's just a matter of 
how much learning you want to do and, and the time you can put into that. And so, um, you know, there's, you know, and then not just academically speaking as well, you know, you know, other ones like, you know, edX and Allison uh, also provide uh, a lot of these opportunities as well, as well as uh, Skillshare. So that's another one where it's not just academic class focus, but a variety of skills, like how to manage your time better or manage a product or, or those kind of things as well. And I think those are uh, equally equally as helpful. You know, and I've taken quite a, quite a few of those on, on a variety of those and I've, you know, always come away with, with more, you know, out of that experience. Thank you, Gabe. And I wanted to add that uh, you mentioned as on Coursera taking the courses, you can also get certificate, a certificate. Certificates yes, in yes. Time. quite a, quite a few, few of these uh, have a certificate and uh, diploma granting uh, courses uh, as they go, and they'll have um, you know numbers or kind of serial numbers that go with it to show that you have you have completed that course. They usually require there are projects and homework and things associated with those courses, so it's not just a you just watch videos and say you did it. You know they actually require participation and and you know proof that you've you've learned you know, you know, throughout, throughout the course, so. Thank you, Gabe. Um, another thing that you can do along with like learning and taking this time as an opportunity to expand your knowledge base is that you can actually start reading papers and they'll provide the literature, especially in topics that are, you are not as familiar as you are, or they are really relevant to your topic. So you can make like a low goal, like having one or two paper read it um, per week and just like write it down the main points. So you have a way to like track it back down and synthesize idea using it for it. So you can start with like review paper. So you get an overall feel of where your feel is and then basically narrow down to more specific papers and basically try to like catch up with the literature that is going happening. Another thing that you can do to like basically expand your knowledge is join science Twitter. So you can follow, for example, SACNA has a Twitter, multiple scientific society have Twitter that you can follow and they have a read of resources available that they share using Twitter as a platform. The National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation, they also have Twitters and their own subdivision additionally have Twitter's account as well where you can find possible funding that you can use for funding your undergraduate project, uh, project or possibly your graduate projects. And if you have a scientist that you're particularly interested and in, you're fascinated by their research, a lot of scientists are starting to like feel the need to join Twitter and share their research through that avenue. So you can basically um, be able to interact with them, get knowledge of their, feed, of their research almost real time and get more exposure to different research program available across the nation and even internationally. You know, kind of to, to expand on that, you can you can talk to your your research advisor, you know, kind of your mentors uh, about some of those funding opportunities. You know, one of those, you know, like Jose mentioned, was the National Science Foundation. Their graduate research fellowship uh, actually has a has a fairly good stipend and payback to the institution. Uh, to essentially kind of pay for your schooling as well. Um, and this is, this is a, a research fellowship, so it's the NSF GRFP, so it's their Graduate uh, Research Fellowship Program. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, uh, applications are due in uh, October of this year, so we've got you know, plenty of time uh, to do that. And it's, it's really kind of about what kind of research do you want to do in the future? You know, and uh, the, the, the nice thing about these is that you know, it's not, it's not a, a very, very long application. It's fairly compact, you know, when it comes to uh, research fellowships. Um, and half of it is, you know, basically what are your research plans? And the other half is, you know, tell us about you and why you want to do this and, you know, what you're interested in learning about. And that's, that's kind of why I like the, the approach to this particular fellowship. It kind of blends itself well, uh, you know, to, to this organization and, and actually this kind of timing as well. 
Awesome. Thank, thank you for sharing uh, about that and, and the description of, of the GRFP. Um, in related to that, I think if you're planning to go to graduate school and you're undergraduate right now or doing your master's or taking a gap year, and I think this, this will be a good time to narrow down that list of potential graduate schools that you would want to apply to and maybe reach out to some graduate students at those institutions and at those programs to see how this situation has affected their workload and how the institutions and their advisors have adjusted during this time. So I think it's a critical time to just ask people um, about how they're doing and, and those, those kinds of expectations um, and to see how, how they've changed. That's a great point, Mario. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to add is that if, if your research is very hands-on and you don't have this opportunity to conduct anything online this summer, uh, one thing you could also think about doing is taking some classes online so that you can make some progress toward your degree. And hopefully when we come back from this, whether it's in the fall or spring, or maybe even following academic year, uh, by getting those classes out of the way, you now have some time during the academic year to do some research and you can, again, look for mentors that you're interested in at your institutions and get reach out to them now to see if you can become involved in their research when we get back to school. Thank you. One of the questions that came up is, would you recommend starting journal clubs to discuss research publications with peers on Zoom? I would recommend it. Um, my lab in particularly, we have been doing journal clubs to keep ourselves informed with the research and basically have that social interaction at the intellectual level. And we basically had two ways of doing it. So one of the things like one person is like the lead um, leader of discussion on one particular paper and we go really in depth into that paper. And the other method that we were being using is what we call um, round robin journal clubs. So everybody has like five minutes to present a really cool paper that they found out and just like present the main points and why it's really cool, basically. I also want to add that. Go ahead, Rosa. <laughs> I also wanted to add that uh, many of uh, undergraduate students uh, participate or are parts of programs like MARC or other similar types of programs that really foster a community of people. And given that we don't have that community currently in person, I really love this idea because it could be a really great uh, way to potentially get together with some of those people in your department or your institu institution and continue to um, seek more knowledge and better prepare yourself to continue to work into the future, even if you cannot be there in person. I really love that. Yeah, and to add to that, um, even in my own lab, we are starting kind of like a writing group where we're, week we're going to meet on a weekly basis. And what we do is it's kind of holding us accountable to writing during this time and e like sharing our results, even though there are previous results, we're still communicating with each other, keeping up to date on articles, and then we're also giving each other feedback. So that's a really wonderful option. Great, thank you. So it takes, takes it to the next part. Um, so if you have any additional questions or would like to connect with one another after this webinar, we invite you to continue the discussion in our online student research presentations uh, community. Follow the link on the screen or in the chat window and sign into your SACNAS membership to get started. You will also uh, be able to connect with all the committee members there as well. If you don't have a SACNAS membership, you can sign up for free at membership.sacnas.org, and I hope to see you there. This concludes our student research presentations webinar. Thank you to all subcommittee members for taking the time to support our students, and have a wonderful day.